Amen. Welcome, welcome again, everyone, in another session of Bible study. You are viewing from overseas, you are viewing locally. And we greet you tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. You're a member, you're not a member, we greet you tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, God is just a good God. I love him. I want to serve him with all my heart. You know, I remember the psalmist that says, I'd rather to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. And, you know, for me, I just want to live for the Lord. I want to, you know, dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And I would encourage you to do the same. So tonight we want to continue our, our series of Bible study. We've been talking about the seven dispensation. And, you know, we've been looking at, from the last time until now, we've been looking at the dispensation of innocence. But before we go any further, we are going to open in prayer. And then we get into the recap and, you know, continue from where we left off. Amen. Lord, we... Love you tonight. We praise your great name. We magnify you. It's a privilege, God, to be here, you know, to share in another session of Bible study. We ask, God, that you will be with us. We pray, God, that whatever is said will give you glory, but it will also edify your people, mighty God. We pray, Lord Jesus, that folks be blessed, that, that, that minds be stirred up, mighty God. And we pray, God, that your blessing will be upon your people. We ask you to have it your way as we present. Be with us one more time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, so we, we like I said, we've been looking at the, the seven dispensations, right? And we list them the last time and we told you what they were and what we were going to look at. Um, so we were on the dispensation of innocence. And, you know, we said that this is the beginning of dispensation. And, you know, we mentioned the period of time that it, it covered. We can go to our slides and then, you know, we just go from our slides. And so we are saying now that the first dispensation is called the dispensation of innocence or the Edenic. And it's called this way Edenic because, you know, it took place over a period of time while Adam and Eve was in the Garden of Eden. And we, we, we can just read through that scripture just one more time. Genesis chapter 1, 27 to 30. So it took place over a period of time while Adam and Eve was in the Garden. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, him, male and female, created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree, in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast, and to every beast of the earth, and of the, of the earth, and to every fowl of the ear, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so so we said that the dispensation covered the period of time while adam and eve were in the garden one of the things that i must point out before about this dispensation before we go on any further and you will see it coming out especially in the two points that you know i'm one of the points that i, I am going to make you know one of the takeaways you know and it is that they because the dispensation has to do with Adam and Eve. We find that, you know, as we look at the dispensation, we can learn a lot as it pertains to man and a woman, a husband and a wife living together. Because, you know, this was this was like, you know, what was there, the, the Adam and Eve, the first couple that God put together, first couple that, that that came together, right? And you can learn a lot from, you know, what was said from scriptures. 
So it covered the period of Adam and Eve in the garden, and Adam and Eve were blessed. One of the things that I like about, you know, God, as I look at the dispensation, is that everything that Adam and Eve had need of, you know, God provided it. He made it before he made them. So even when they sinned and, and, and there was a need for blood to shed, the animal was made long before Adam and Eve sinned. And, you know, God just have a way of knowing what his people need. He just have a way of knowing what, you know, his people have need of. When he, he, he saw Adam, uh, and he said, Adam, it was not good for Adam to be alone. He made Adam an helpmate. And it was not that God did not know that there was coming a time when, you know, he would saw in Adam that Adam had a need for an helpmate. He knew, but, you know, he chose to make the man first. So, next slide. So, when we look now at the command that was given, we went through this last week. We said the Lord gave a command, and this is in Genesis chapter 2, 15 to 17. And the Lord took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every three tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou wilt surely die. So, you know, God gave Adam the commandment, and, you know, it was with three we said that Adam was, was, was tested, right? Remember what I said last week, that Adam was made a free will moral being. He had the, this, the, the ability to choose, and because he had the ability to choose, this ability would have been tested by God, right? And even in today's time, as Christians, the, 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 the ability to choose that we have is tested day by day. And if any day we get up and, and, and do not make the decision to live for God, we are going to find that we will sin as, as easy as one, two, three. So every day we have to be conscious of making up in our minds to live for God. So God gave the man the commandment with trees in, in the midst of the garden. He was tested. Remember we said that there was a tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve disobeyed the commandment of the Lord and they sinned. So man failed to keep God's commandment, came through temptation from the devil. So the adversary came to Eve and he said, look here, Eve, did God really say that, you know, you must, um, you, you must not eat from the tree? Because, you know, in the day, and, you know, he has a way of twisting, you know, the word of God. And he twisted the word of God. And Eve, now she considered what was said to her by the adversary. And Eve realized now that, you know, the thing, she, she became desirous of the thing. And because she became desirous of the thing, she ate and she disobeyed the command of God. Remember, we also stressed the point last week that it was to the man that God gave the commandment. And we will talk about that a little bit more today, tonight. It was to the man that God gave the commandment. And, you know, the, no doubt that the man would have communicated that commandment to Eve. So the, 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 the adversary now went to Eve and he got her to partake of the tree. But the woman now, she was able to get to the man. Remember now we said last week that, that, that when Adam saw her, he said, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman. Um, he was in love. And, you know, he, there was this bonding, bond between both of them. And, you know, I just don't know what it was. But, you know, she was able to influence him to disobey the command of God. And we'll be looking at that at length tonight. Right? So she was able to get Adam and Eve to disobey the command of the Lord. The adversary asked Eve, Eve a seemingly innocent question. Had God said, did God really tell you? So Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, 6 to 7, right? They, they ate. They ate and they sinned against the Lord. The next slide. 
So the couple tried to cover themselves and to cover their sins because they recognize now that, you know, they sin. And the couple recognized that they were naked and they tried to sew fig leaves together to cover themselves. While they hid themselves from the Lord, they heard the voice of the Lord come and calling out, Adam, Adam, where art thou? We made the point also that Adam was now out of his place. And we said that as people of God, if we are, we are not doing certain things like praying, fasting, reading the word, meditating upon the word, we are out of our place. We made that point last week, last week. And we said that if you are not doing these things, you are out of your place. And we should be doing these things to get back to a place of worship, to a place where God wants us to be. Amen. So it's important then, bridging that, you know, we make sure that, you know, we, we do what it is that we are supposed to do, right? Because, you know, God, God wants fellowship, fellowship with, with, with man. And he wants us to give him our best, right? And giving him our best is to give him our undivided attention. So if we are, not, if we, if we are putting something else in front of God, you know, we need to make a change in terms of, you know, finding our place of, of prayer, finding, you know, time to read the word, finding time, you know, just to spend with God, right? And, and that is important to us as Christians. So now we look at the judgment and we said that the blame be, game began Genesis chapter 3, 10 um, to 13. The Lord gave the commandment to the man and we said it before that the Lord gave the commandment to the man and Somehow Satan got them to sin and God now pronounced judgment on the serpent in Genesis chapter 3, 14 and 15. And God pronounced judgment on the woman, Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. He said that childbearing will now be in sorrow. You know, thy desire shall be towards thy, woman, thy husband. And we we'll look at that at length. We're not going back to it. We're just doing a quick recap. And then now we look at how the Lord moved to pronounce judgment upon the man in Genesis chapter 3, 17 to 19. It's a curse be the grown fire for thy sake. It's a in shower shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread. So, you know, God curse them, pronounce a judgment on them, you know, because they choose to disobey the commandment of God. The mode of deliverance, we said, in every dispensation, God has made a way of escape. Um, and there's a judgment, but God has made a way of escape. The righteousness of God, we said, demanded that sin be punished by death. But grace, unmerited favor was, 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 was at work. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. And God forgave them by, by killing this animal and using the blood of that animal as an atonement for their sin. We mentioned the scripture last week that came, from, that came from Hebrews chapter 9, I think, verse 22, that without the shedding of blood, that there is no remission of sin. And this now, what God did, start a foundation work throughout scriptures. Because you're going to recognize that when all of the patriarchs and, and all of those folks, they wanted to, to, to worship God or they wanted to get forgiveness of sin, what they did was to sacrifice a lamb. And this was, you know, the foundation of a greater work to come in Jesus Christ. But grace and merited favor was at work. And God, you know, worked out a way to cover their sins. So now we are at where we left off last week. And we are now looking at one or two takeaways from the dispensation. So the first point we made we, we, was that the, the couple were naked and they tried to cover themselves. This now for, for, for me is, 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 is a burden, right, so to speak. This is what I get from, you know, looking at the dispensation in terms of, you know, the couple covering themselves, right? So, and then B, to Adam, he said, because you have heeded to the voice of your wife. Right? What is it that, 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 that the wives can learn from this? What is it that as husbands we can learn from this? And I am going to go through, like I said earlier on, 
they, they, we talk some things about marriage here and about couple husband and wife why because the dispensation is about a husband and wife and there's a lot that we can learn so let us go to point a let us find the scripture genesis chapter 3 7 to 11 right the couple tried to cover their sins which they somehow associated with their sex organs right um so when they sinned, they were, they were naked, you know. But they did not recognize or uh, there was no shame in being naked until sin came about. Brethren, I want us to understand that when we look around us and we see all that is happening, you have to now begin to wonder within yourself what is happening within the society. So Genesis chapter 3. 7 to 11, and the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. So let us go back to the first verse a bit. Uh, and let me see if I can have you to, 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 to see the scripture here. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. So it was both of them, I'm running a little bit ahead of myself, but it was Adam and Eve that were together in the garden after God made man and he saw that there was a need for a companion God made the female and the female and the male was dear together but when they sinned this is the Bible now telling you now that they sowed fig leaf and cover themselves they made apron why 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 did they cover themselves and it was only both of them there as male and female. Remember, the voice of God, are, 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 are there was the, the, supposed to be an a, a image of God, or whatever it was that met with them in the cool of the day, right? That did not happen until the next verse. The, 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 the moment they found out that they sinned was the moment they recognized that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together without the presence of God being there. So it's, it is like when a, 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 a two persons are in courtship, right? When you just get married, you know, you, you tend to be a little bit shy and you hide away yourself. And it's not until you, 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 you get into the marriage now, then you are able to be in your birth, your suit around your, your spouse. You know, at the initial stage, you kind of feel away. And both Adam and Eve, they were together. And they sowed fig leaves to cover themselves from each other. The next verse. And they heard the voice of, the God, of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves. So it was after now they covered themselves. They were together and covered themselves from each other. And they know they covered themselves and they also were now were no hiding from the presence of God. Amongst the trees in the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? As thou eaten from the tree whereof I command thee that thou shouldest not eat? So the couple, 
in their state of innocence, did not realize that they were naked. There was no shame in being naked before there was sin. Genesis chapter 2 verse 25 said, And they were both naked, the man and in his wife, and were not ashamed. So this is saying to us in our brethren, that there is a certain kind of shame when we expose ourselves. Before Adam and Eve were sinned, they were both naked, but yet they were unashamed. The Bible said that. They were truly innocent, so their nudity was sinless and free of shame. So the passage that we read earlier on lets us know that it was after they sinned, then it occurred to them a new occurrence. But we are naked. They instantly recognized that they were naked. They found a way to cover themselves. And the eyes of them, the Bible said, were both open. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So, so man now, because he recognized the wrong that he did in terms of disobeying the commandment of God. And because he recognized that he was now naked, he somehow tried to over himself. The couple tried to cover themselves, which they somehow associated with their sex organs. They tried to cover themselves. But because of the innate, so instantly they recognized that they were naked. And we have that scripture, we have that scripture already. And then now, the knowledge of good and evil, I have it in red, creates a fearful urge for them to cover themselves. So instantly they were aware that they were naked and they were also ashamed. Though they have never worn clothes before, this knowledge of, of good and evil now it creates a fear. A fearful urge for them to cover themselves. To cover themselves from each other. To mistrust each other's motive and thoughts. And to protect themselves. That is why I point out in the scripture that they cover themselves before even the presence of God was, was there in the cool of the day. So because of this innate awareness in the conscience of the distinction between men and women, God commands a covering. The sinful, this sinful death nature is tempted by the sight of unclothed human body. Hence, to be Fully clothed is necessary. So what I'm saying here, Virgin, because of the sinful nature, there is something that happens when a man sees a woman in skimpy dressing or when he sees a woman naked. Something happened to a man. I wonder if anything happened to a lady when she sees a man in a... a, in a, a um, Back in, back in the days, they used to call them thing muscle shirt. So I wonder if anything trouble a lady when she see a man in muscle shirt. Chances are. So, because of the sinful nature that, that we know inherit, and, the, uh, uh, and because of the, the, the sin that Adam and Eve did, and the sinful nature now passed on to all mankind, you recognize that this thing, when we see it does something to us as men and it does something to us as women. So note, like I said earlier on, they were the only people there. Oh, glory to God. But they covered themselves from each other and then now they hid themselves from God because 
there is a certain shame that is associated with nakedness after sin came into the world. Hallelujah. So, so there is a certain shame, brethren, after sin came into the world. So what has changed? Because, because I have a burden, you know. What has changed? Mankind still has a sin problem. For we, the psalmist says, for we were born in sin and shapen in iniquity and in sin were we conceived. I want us to understand, Virgin. I said it before, but, 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 but listen it again. Because this initial sin from Adam, as mankind, we inherit a sinful nature. And the Bible also tells us that the heart of men is desperately wicked. But you're going to see it as we go down in the other dispensation. How is it that man leave from a place where he was in communion with God and leave to a place where he kill his brother? Leave to a place where they commit all kind of sin and evil. It is because this nature that we were made with. If we were sinless, then it would not bother us. But because of sin, the worst of man is on the forefront. So man still has, mankind still has a sin problem. For we were all born in sin. The Bible said there is no right, none righteous, no, not one. So we, so the sin problem has gotten worse and worse. And we have seen in this day and age where people walk around almost naked and there is no shame. What has happened from the time of Adam and Eve? Until now, when Adam and Eve sin, they recognize that they sin, and they recognize that there is a certain shame with being naked, and they cover themselves. So there is no sense of pride right now among men. And when I say man, man, I'm talking about man and woman in in general, right? The conscience is dead. Dead. Nakedness and lewdness are the order of the day. So the other day, brethren, I was, I was, uh, when I was putting it together, and I, I said to myself, Elder boy, you stopped long enough to see that the lady went in the taxi. But anyway, let me share the story with you. I was purchasing some things on the side of the road. And I see this lady just run across the road. As a matter of fact, she walk across the road. But the lady was in her underwear and a bra in a mesh marina. Talking about nakedness and lewdness is the order of the day. Mesh marina, bra and underwear. Broad daylight. When you're talking about an evening, you know. Broad daylight. And what the lady did was to fan down a taxi. And she went in the taxi. And this was not a chartered taxi. It was a robot. But what has happened to the mind of men and women? Why they are at this place? And in the initial stage, Adam and Eve recognized that they were, were naked and covered themselves. And now we are living in a time where people, I don't think it's because the sun is hot, you know. I know that when persons are demon possessed, they will strip down themselves in their birthday suit because they are not in their right mind. But when a person is, so to speak, in their right mind, 
them not possessed by the devil, by a devil. And they walking almost in their birthday suit. Something is wrong. Mankind have lost their moral compass. For somebody to walk around like that, something is wrong. And we have seen from the time of Adam until now that mankind is heading down a slippery slope. To some, the nakedness and lewdness is not a problem. And they might say that I sound foolish and, and old fashioned. You know, but God's word does not change or conform to the times. Next slide. The Bible is consistent about, speak, uh, 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 about clothing. It speaks about clothing in terms of righteousness, whereas nakedness represents sin and its corresponding shame. So whenever the Bible talks about righteousness, it talks about being clothed. Let us find Revelation 19, 19.8. Whenever it, talks, it, it, it talks about you know, righteousness, it talks about being clothed. Um, and then when it talks about sin and shame, it talks about nakedness. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So righteousness is talking about being clothed. So many times the Bible speaks about certain things in terms of righteousness and clothes. It always talks about being clothed. But when it talks about sin, it talks about being naked. Brethren, I am saying to us from scriptures that there is a certain, there, there, there is a certain shame of exposing ourselves. There's a certain shame of being naked. So the sinful are depicted in various states of undress. Let us find the one in Ezekiel 6, 36. Thus say the Lord God. 1636, sorry. Thus say the Lord God, because thy filthiness was poured out and thy nakedness discovered through thy whoredoms with thy lovers, and with all the idols of thine abomination. And by the blood of thy children which thou gavest to them. So what the Bible is saying here. Is that the Lord God associated filthiness. With nakedness. Because of the wordom that the children of Israel did. Let us look at Revelation chapter 3 verse 17. Because thou says, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor, and blind, and naked. So, Bridget, what I'm saying to us is that nakedness, when it talks about righteousness, it talks about being clothed. When people are in their right mind, we talk about that they are clothed in their right mind. How many times we testify and say, yes, God, I'm clothed in my right mind. He woke me up this morning, I'm clothed in my right mind, and yes, you know, God is a good God. But when we talk about 
the, 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 the undress and the nakedness is talking about sin and shame. That is what is associated with nakedness. So when Adam and Eve, brethren, saw that they were naked, recognized after sinning that they were naked, they covered themselves. And we are living in a country where people have no shame in walking naked. And they're not mad. They're not possessed by a demon. They leave nothing to the imagination. As such, a culture view of nakedness reveal its proximity to God. Hallelujah. So what he's saying to us, you know, sometimes we say that Jamaica is a, is a godly country and people will pray a whole lot and the storms turn back. But when you see a country view of nakedness, it reveals our proximity to God. The people are walking naked and there's a certain shame in walking naked and people don't see that there's certain, a certain shame. What we see as norm in our Jamaican society tells us that we are a people far from God. Our culture exposes itself as far from God. And we should ask the question, where do our standards lie in the spectrum? We can only change the world, brethren. Next slide. We can only change the world one soul at a time. Meaning that we can only we can minister to the to a soul one day at a time. Or one soul at a time. We cannot change the world. They are the world and they will do what the God of the world wants them to do. This is how Satan wants them to behave. So we can only minister the word. Pray that somebody will accept the gospel and come and know God. So Adam and Eve realized the real issue, brethren, the real issue that I am having. The, the Adam and Eve realized that they were naked and sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. God himself knew the importance of being properly covered. And he knew that the fig leaves were inadequate. Hence, he used the skin of animals to properly cover them. Brethren, I want you to understand that the Adam and Eve used the fig leaves to hide their sex organs. And God look at them in the state of sin that they were and knew that the fig leaves were inadequate. I want us to understand, Virgin, that how we see covering ourselves, God see covering us in a different light. What we think is adequate, God looks at it as inadequate. Genesis chapter 3, verse, and to Adam and also to his wife did God made coats of skin and clothe them. Firstly, the killing of this animal to take, for the killing of this animal to take place, to take the place of the fig coverings is a shadow of future events in the Old and New Testament. Let's go to the next slide, right? It is a shadow of future things in the Old and the New Testament, which were given by God to perform by, by humans, but was insufficient to, com to, to completely and permanently bridge the gap between man and God. So God said to the, the, the folks in the Old Testament, this is what you need to do. Kill an animal, you know, and, and ask for atonement, and I will pardon your sin for a, for a, for a period of time, right? Uh, but that was performed by man Given to man by God 
performed by a man, but it was inadequate, right? And therefore, God sent his son as the perfect blood sacrifice to atone for the sins once and for all. I also want us to understand, Bridging, that if the thing was not important, hallelujah, the Bible would not have made mention of it. Did you know that, you know, as we read through some of the, 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 the stories, that there are a lot of things that the Bible don't mention about it. But the things that are really important, Virgin, the Bible makes mention of it. So I made the point and I want us to know that in the mind of the man, in the mind of Adam and Eve, oh Jesus, the fig leaves were adequate at the moment. Jesus. But for God, it was not. Not in the spiritual. Not in the physical. This is why he covered them with the skins of animals. You, you, you did not look at it that way. What they, because of sin. Before sin, it was not a problem. But because of sin, God put it there as an example for us, for us to know that as men, we have to think of covering ourselves as though God wants us to be covered. Not only in the spiritual, but also how we attire ourselves. So as children of God, as children of the Lord, there should be a holy way to which we carry ourselves. There should be a holy shame. I wonder if I could use shame there. To which we carry ourselves, which means that we're carrying ourselves in such a way that we look like Christ. I want us to know, Bridget, that as children of the Lord, we should have a holy pride. Holy pride to which we carry ourselves. As men, we cannot come to church in pants so tight that is showing the size of our genitals. So if you are not careful and you wear loose clothes because the, 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 the makers know they are making tight pants. And the pants is close fitted and the jacket is close fitted. So if you are not careful, you have to go to get a tailor. Buy a little bit bigger and get the tailor to adjust it. But what the young people are doing, because it's a style, they go to the tailor and they take up the clothes tight. And it's a fashion, so the man pants is tight. He can't keep him bill falling in pocket. He can't hardly keep him phone in his pocket. And the pants is so tight that it's showing his genitals. It happened in the world, and we see it happening in church. But this was the same genitals, you know, that because if you have on a cover, and you don't cover good, it is still a problem. If you're in a building, if you're in a house, and the rooftop having oil and rain falling and it leaking, the roof not good. And bridging, it's a similar thing if we, if we have on clothes. But we're still showing the genitals, which the same genital Adam and Eve associated their nakedness with and cover it. And God said, you know, cover good, but me cover you better.
Hallelujah. So I make sure to talk about the men first, you know. Because I don't want the ladies to think that, you know, that when we, when we look at clothing in the Bible, the Bible tends to speak about, speak to the females more than the males. So I speak to the men first. But ladies, your clothing should not be revealing. It should not be that, that, that ladies come to church in the dress so tight that it's showing everything. It's showing the dimples them. It's showing the type of underwear. It's showing everything. And the shirt, the skirt should not be so short that it's showing your legs. Adam and Eve recognize that they sinned and that there was a certain shame in walking naked. And they cover themselves. God said that that was not adequate enough and God Kill the animal, yes, to atone for their sin, but to cover them. And the Bible took time out to mention it. There is a certain shame with exposing oneself. You can find that scripture. So the skirt virgin should not be so short that, that the legs are showing. The top should not be. You know, sometimes I'm in church, you're talking to a sister, but you have to turn your head because you're seeing her. Our breasts. And you have to turn away your head a little bit. Because as men, you don't want your mind to stray. In like manner also, that the woman adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness. So, so the King James Version used shamefacedness and sobriety. Not with brided hairs or gold, or pearls, or costly arrears. I want you to find for me the New Living Translation of that verse. So there is a certain shame regime with exposing oneself. And this is why the Bible in the New Testament says that the woman should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control. And I want the woman to be modest in their appearance. So, 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 so let us understand it now. How you look, you're supposed to be modest. They should wear decent and appropriate clothing. Hallelujah to God. And not to draw attention to themselves. Jesus. So a lot of the time, yes, I am not telling any female not to look good when you come out your house. My wife is putting on a little bit of weight. And if the skirt tight, I am the first one that's going to tell her, I say, look here, that skirt is tight, you know. Well, she know that she, she but me have to help her out too. Look here, that skirt tight, that skirt they can't wear good. So, you should not put on clothing and fix the ear by wearing of pearls. And draw attention to yourself by wearing expensive clothing and revealing clothing. Adam and Eve, oh Jesus, they recognize how is it that, that as Christians, our conscience is now supposed to be alive. And, and if our consciences are alive, then we must 
recognize we must feel our way any man being christ is a new creature when you're coming out of your house the holy ghost must say unless your content's dead that is not a poor prayer brethren i want you to understand Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? You see, you see, when you put on your clothes, you can ask yourself that, you know, because you can cause your brother to sin or your sister to sin when you put on that kind of clothes and come in, not even in the house of God, but just walking on the road. So there is a certain shame that comes with exposing oneself. This is why the Bible in the New Testament said that the woman should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control. So, so my, from my first point, my first takeaway, you know, this is it, that, you know, we should, you know, dress decent, we should dress, you know, in such a way that we represent Christ, that when we look, people look at us, they see that we are Christian, we now come reveal things to our brothers and to our sisters in church to have their mind to stray so that they sin against God. Because remember, you know, Jesus said in the New Testament, you don't have to do the action, you know, but once your mind goes astray, you sin. And if the thing, because of the sinful nature, I made the point earlier, and because of the sinful nature, when we see naked stuff and, and, and partial naked stuff, if you're not strong in your mind, your mind gone astray. And the adversary does put a thought in your mind, inject a thought in your mind. Because he did it with Judas. And what you have to do? You have to try and kick up at that thought and say, in the name of Jesus, thought you're not having your way. So imagine now as men, because we struggle sometimes as men. But as men, we, we, we out of the world, we out of church, and we have to cover our face. Imagine coming into church. So, Virgin, this is my first point. They hid themselves. They recognized that they were naked. And they hid themselves because there is a certain shame with being naked. As people of God, I implore us, man, be modest. Both male and female, be modest. Look at how you, you, you attire yourself. Look at how you come to church. Look at how you dress. Not just at church, you know, but even on the road. Adam and Eve were together, husband and wife. But they still put on apron even before God came calling. Hallelujah. So let us now go to the other point. So two takeaways. So the first takeaway is that one. The second takeaway, right, speaks to the influence that the woman has in the marriage. Genesis chapter 3 verse 17. I want our wives to understand. Remember, and I'm, and I'm saying it again. We, we talk about the marriage stuff because it was the first dispensation and the first dispensation um, speaks greatly to marriage. It speaks to husband and wife. So I just want to make the points as I feel led, you know, from a second takeaway, right? The second takeaway is that the wives have a certain influence in the marriage that, that they are not aware of. That the husband... Sometimes it's not aware of. I want our wives to know. And to those who, who, who are thinking about getting married. And to those who, 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 who will get married. I want you folks to know. That you have a huge part to play. In whether your marriage is successful or not. You have a huge part to play. in whether or not your marriage work out. So, back to the scripture. And unto Adam he said, this was when God was cursing Adam, you know. I was stressed the point last week. Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. 
first middle ground. We can't stop there. He said, because you hearken unto the voice of the Lord. I made the point. Look here. God gave Adam the commandment to, to every successful man. They said that there is a good woman. There is a certain influence, brethren. There is a certain influence, ladies. There is a certain influence, wives. That you have in the marriage. You can either make it or break it. So look at Ephesians 5 verse 23. The Bible says that the man is the head of the house. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. So, so the Bible is clear, God is clear that man is the head of the house. There's another scripture say that God made the man first, right? And, and it says that it was the weaker vessel that, that the, the devil tempted first. But the man is the head of the house and it is established by God right God makes it clear who should be the head of the house and accord this is according to God's design in the family but we are brethren and let me say this part go to the next slide and, and let, let me say this part because you know sometimes when we hear as 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 men that we are the head of the house we are thinking that anything that we say that is what have to happen. So if I tell the wife to jump, she must ask, oh, hi. I want to dispel that thought tonight, brethren. And I want us to understand that we will err, err if we disregard all aspect of headship because we are the head of the house. We must understand what headship is. The head cannot function on its own. It is dependent on the rest of the body as the body is dependent on the head. So God is careful to define headship by comparing it to Christ and the church from the same Ephesians 5 there. And the headship role is best fulfilled when the husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So the man has the responsibility to lead his family to God. A good role model to follow how to lead your family is Christ. This can only mean one thing. That man is supposed to follow the path of a servant leader Jesus put it this way find the scripture Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 20 25 to 28 so a good role model to follow is what Jesus and Jesus said it this way but Jesus called them unto him and said he knew that the princes of the Gentiles exercised dominion over them. And they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came, not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. This passage line up with what Ephesians says, that the husband should be willing to give his life 
bless the name of God, for his wife. And Jesus said, now, if a man want to run his family, we use the scripture there, if a man want to do his family well, he has to serve his family, have to be a servant, and then he must be willing to give his life a ransom for his family. So tell yourself, men, that you are the head of the house and you are not willing to do this, you're going to have a problem. So let me put that out of the way from now. So you can't say, boy, honey, Elder Billy said me at the head of the house. The head of the house and you're not following this scripture. You disqualify yourself. So, this leader of the family then, must imitate Christ, must follow the teachings of Christ. He's tuned into his family needs. Go to the next slide. He's tuned into his family needs. And is concerned for its spiritual welfare. He looks at ways to help members of his family grow in their relationship with God. He is tuned into the needs of his family. He provides physical support. He encourage, he's ready to protect and defend. He's ready to lay down his life for those who have been entrusted to his care. In hard times, in good times, in season out of season, he's ready to give his all for his family. This kind of man possesses certain kind of qualities, you know. He must be strong in his communication with God because if as a man you want to lead your family the right way, so that when you say to your wife, God tell me, say, she knows how God talk to you. So you must have a close relationship with God. You must be proactive. Spotting potential challenges to the welfare of your wife and children and those around you. You must be characterized by integrity, seeking the safest and wisest and, and, and good ways to deal with your family. Such a man. God will speak to first. What I mean by this? I want us to understand, wives, men, that if you're doing what God wants you to do, you're, you're, you're living how God wants you to live, you have a close relationship with God, you're concerned about your family, you're willing to give your all for them, God will speak to you first as the man in regards to what move he wants to make with the family. So if there is a vision, the Lord will reveal the vision to the man first. Oh God. Now there are many times, Bridget, when we as men, when we as men, we say that We hear from God. God tell us something. But sometimes out of our heart desire, we, we believe that God tell us. But sometimes God don't really tell us. But husband, remember that the wife has a voice. 
even when you know that it is the Lord that spoke to you. Hear our oath and pray about it. So I remember years ago, Virgin, I, I was, we were going to, we were praying about a house. And, you know, the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, I'm going to give you this house. I'm a whole on to the word of God. No, when I mention it to my wife, I probably she don't remember it. But when I mentioned it to her, she said, well, she not sure that she going to live at this place. So I go back to God and I said, God, how is it that you tell me, say, you going to give me this house? But my wife tell me, say, she don't want to live here. I said, God, if you really tell me, you know, you have to know, bring her to the place that she will know that this is where you want us to live. So when, 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 when she said, all right, honey, we're going to look at that piece of land or we're going to do that, look at that piece of house. You think that I tell her that? God promised me, say, Ma, give me this house. I go and me and I go. And we discuss it and we look about it and, and, and we talk. But eventually, it come right back round till she said, Boy, Ozzy, you look like a this house we have to go buy. But I am saying to us, that God will speak to the man first. If there is a vision, the Lord will reveal it to the man first. Oh, glory to God. Wives, remember, last week we talked about thy desire shall be towards thy husband. What did we say? That you are going to want to rule the man. But God said the man will rule over you. Let's go to the next slide. So God. Listen to me. Is not the author of confusion. He will speak to the man first. The man is the head of the house. He will reveal it to the man first. The man is the head of the house. God gave the commandment to Adam. Adam was made first and God gave the commandment to him. He said, thou shalt not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The man now had the responsibility to relate to the family. So, so from, from here in Genesis, you know, we see the principle how God operates. If you have a, a thing to tell the family, if you have a way to direct the family, this is what I want the family to do. He will talk to the man that does everything that I tell you earlier on in the slides, that that is what the man is supposed to do. God will talk to such a man first. However, Bridget, the influence of the woman is so great that if she is not careful, she will cause the man to forget about the commandment of the Lord. She will cause the man to lose out on the vision of God. She will call the, cause the man to disregard the voice of God. Man is the head of the house, but there is a certain influence that women have. It is not good for a man to be alone. So God make man a help me that have a certain influence over him. You read it already? Genesis chapter 3, 17 to 19. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, 
and has eaten of the tree which I command thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. He said, Curse be the ground. So God was so mad at Adam that because, amen, Adam disobeyed the command and obeyed his wife, God cursed even the ground. Wives, you are able to influence your husband. Hallelujah. Wives, you are able to influence your husband more than you know, more than he knows. You are able to make or break your marriage. Adam's wife influenced him. And he disobeyed the command of God. The same God that he knew that God made him. He communed with God in the cool of the day. It must be something extraordinary. Oh Jesus. But 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 Eve was able to influence Adam. They say Solomon was the wisest man, you know. But Solomon had many wives. And, and, and being the wisest man, you must know say God are God. And these wives were able to influence him to serve false God. The influence of the wife. We have another slide. Wives, the things that you do can drive. The things that you do can drive your husband away. Or they can pull him closer to you because you have influence. The things you do can make or break your marriage. Because you have influence. So I remember years ago, Bishop Grizzle, he, he, he related a story and he said that there was a lady that came to him and said, Pastor, Pastor, boy, I have a problem. And he said, what is the problem? She said, you know, my husband stay out. Every night he stay out and he play damn one. I can't bother with it. He, he, he stay out with him friends them instead of coming home to me. And she complained to the pastor. But being the wise man that he was, you know, the pastor said, look here. When him come in late, what is it that you do? She said, pastor, I'm not cuss him out because him, have, him supposed to come home to me and he not come home to me, so I curse him out. And pastor said, what else you do? She said, boy, pastor, not even share me share with him dinner. He have to share that out for himself. He can't play that with him friend and come home when he feel like I expect me to share out him dinner. And the man, say, the man of God said, if you continue like this, he soon stop coming home. And he said, let me tell you what you do. So he told her some changes that she must do. And she said, he said, report to me in one month time and tell me what happened. And he tell her, you see, when he come in late, stop cursing. Don't curse him. Start asking him how the damn no game go and ask him who gets six love. Ask him if he don't get any six love. And then he tell her, I said, no, when he come, just share with him dinner and warm it up for him. Take off him shoes, off him feet, and rub him feet. Treat him good. Before the month was out, the lady come back to him. Past, past, past. Boy, yeah, man, I got you know, the thing work, man. May I tell you, say, the man that even played that many women around so again, he just come home my evening time. The influence of the, the woman, you know, is as men sometimes we want to hang out with a friend, you know, we want to hang out with a friend. But may I tell you, the, the, the influence of the woman was able to get this man to come home, stop playing with him, friends, because of how she treat him. So what you do, ladies, can drive him away or can pull him closer to you. 
what you said to him can cause him to disobey the voice of God or cause him to obey the voice of God. So as I went through, I see 10 points from Jolene Engel, right? And, and, and I believe that these are good points for me to point out to, to wives. Um, how to influence, right, your husband, or how to make your husband, or, or to, it will make your marriage work in essence, right? The first point, she said that, you know, you must be a wife you can trust, right? She said influence comes from trust, and without trust, there is no influence. So you must be a wife that the man don't have to be thinking, based on your behavior, him, him don't have to think anything negative, right? You know that, you know, you're a lady that he can trust. Right? The second point to me to say, you must be kind and gracious to him. You know, you know, make him feel welcome by this. And it's when she when she when when the lady know, when the man come home and the lady take off him, him shoes and rub him, rub him, rub him feet them. Him feel welcome, you know, and him feel say, boy, yes, may I get this thing at home where me never used to get. What change? And him feel welcome. Stand in his corner. So you see, sometimes. Your husband might come up with something and, and him say, well, God tell him and it's not really God tell him. But this is how he feels. Stand in his corner. This means the world to him when he knows that his spouse is stand, standing in his corner. You might not like to do a certain thing, but the man will appreciate you more when you help him to do certain things or you, 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 you just visit him at certain times and say, boy, this thing look good that you're doing or, you know, just something like that. But stand in his corner and give him the support rather than to back him into a corner. When you back him into a, you ever back a, 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 a cat into a corner yet? Or a, or a dog into a corner? They want to bite. So stand in his corner. And fight with him, right? Number four, support him in his endeavors by believing in him and following him. This makes him feel like he can conquer anything. So anything that he, he mark you might not be according to the will of God. But you support him, you know, prayerfully too. And you say, God, if the thing is not of you, guide us. I remember years ago, I wanted to, because the fever catch, you know, everybody, everybody going to Canada, so I catch the fever. And I said, I wanted to go. But I prayed while he was praying. Till eventually I saw the will of God. I saw what God wanted me to do, right? So, support him, man, in his endeavors, right? So, he, yeah, she, she, she gave her voice, boy, I don't want to migrate. But she still... Help me pray. I will find the mind of God. Right? Number five. Esteem him, esteem him in public. There is no high, higher compliment. So compliment him man, in, in public. Compliment him when you are around your friends. You understand? There is no higher um, compliment in his, in, in his eyes than that. Right? So be a safe place for him, she said. When everywhere else, it is storm and thundering. You must be a safe place that him can come to and talk to. Accept him for who he is rather than judging him for his shortcoming, right? So he wants you to be a safe place. Then she said, let him know you are praying for him, which is important. Even if him unsaved, let him know that you are praying for him. So you believe that because the man is unsaved, God will not impress it upon his heart how he should direct the family. Because he's unsaved. God will speak to the unsaved man how to run the family still. Or to direct the family still.
Number no, eight, be passionate. Be a passionate wife. Pursue him intimately. Number nine, put him before the children. Who him respect. By teaching your children how to respect him, even if the, 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 the children are not his. You come and you're married to you and you have your children. They are not his. Teach them how to respect him. Choose to be a joyful wife. Right? Be content with life rather than gripe about life. The Bible in Proverbs 12 verse 4, King James Version, it says, A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that make it a shame is of rottenness in his bone. An excellent wife is one who seeks influence her husband to bring glory to God rather than herself. Wife, before, before you seek to influence your husband, talk to God before. Husband might come to you with an idea. Talk to God before. He might come to you with you know, something that him feel like you know, this is the direction that we should take as a family. Talk to God before. Because, just like Eve did, she caused Adam to disobey the command of God. If you are not careful because of the influence that you have as a wife, you will cause your husband to neglect the vision of the Lord, to turn his back on God, to, 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 to disobey the command of God. You'll cause your wife to... to Leave the marriage. Your husband to leave the marriage. Sorry. Because of the influence in power that you have. So an excellent wife is one who seeks to use her influence to bring glory to God. And not herself. Right? So, so you influence your husband and you influence him to bring glory to God. And not yourself. So point seven. Which is, what is it that we can learn about the Lord? Like I said earlier on um, in, 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 in our introduction, we, it would make sense that we look at the dispensation and, you know, don't see what is it that we can learn about God. But most of the time we're going to see that, you know, it is basically, we, we can, basically the same things. And what I will do is try to draw out other areas that, you know, we can learn. But most of the time you're going to see that God is, it, it, it always have a plan. Adam and Eve disobeyed the Lord. And the adversary got them to disobey the command of God. When he got them to disobey the command of God, he thought that this was it for man. Because the same way how God dealt with him, he thought that this was how God was going to deal with man. When he sinned, you know, he didn't get a chance to repent, right? And God just kicked him out of heaven and, and he, he sentenced there's a time that is going to come in, that, that is going to come when he will be sentenced, right? To the bottomless pit. But for man, he thought that this was going to be the same thing for man. But God had a plan. Bridging the fact that they sin, sin that did not caught God by surprise. And that is why we have Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I'll put enmity between thy seed and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So this is the first prophecy that we have in Bible that talks about the coming of Jesus Christ. Right? And God had a plan in store from before the foundation. And I like this scripture. I always quote this one in Acts 15, 18. It says, known to God are all his works from the beginning of the world. So even from before God said, let there be and there was. Remember, he is from everlasting past to everlasting present. And time is but as a dot 
in, in the span of eternity. So God see yesterday and him see tomorrow and him see next year and him see everything that is going to happen. So when anything happens, you don't take God by surprise. Known to God are all his works from before the foundation of the earth. So God always have a plan, have a plan brethren, and it did not took him by surprise the fact that Adam and Eve sinned. Right? And then the next point about what it is that we can learn from God, that God is a merciful God. Mer uh, um, God being merciful basically means that when we deserve punishment, he does not punish us and in fact blesses us instead of punishing us. Mercy is withholding of a just condemnation. So when Adam and Eve sinned, the just reward as punishment was death for the waging of sin is death. However, God fully demonstrated his mercy. Right? And this mercy, we said that it was demonstrated through the sacrificing of an animal. Through the Bible, we see where, where there are many illustrations of God's mercy. In the psalm, the psalm says that God is a merciful God. It says that his mercies endure it forever. Right? So, so, so God's mercy is rooted in his love for us. Um, he is merciful, large and in part because he is love. First John 4 verse 8 tells us that God is love. So as sinners, we deserve punishment. But God's righteousness demands punishment for sin. He wouldn't be holy, brethren otherwise. So the righteousness of God demands punishment for sin. And the holiness of God requires that. So, but since God loves us and since he's a merciful God, he sent his son, John 3 verse 16, for God so loved the world, and he sent his son to die for the sins of the world. The fullness of his mercy is seen in Matthew chapter 27. Jesus was, was brutally beaten, murdered on a cross on behalf of mankind. Jesus received the just condemnation and we receive God's mercy in return. Brethren, Mercy triumphs over judgment. And when we look at this dispensation, what is it that we can learn about God? God always have a plan and his mercy was extended towards Adam and Eve. They should have been put to death because they disobeyed his commandment. But because he's a merciful God and he loves mankind, he found a way to atone their sin. So, Virgin, here ended the first dispensation. Surely we could have dealt with other things within the dispensation, but under God we felt that we we felt that we touched the points that God would have us to touch. And we speak the things that God would have us to speak. Virgin, when all is said and done, this is not about how we can put the material together, but this is, a how, this is about how we can apply the word of God to our life. I am not just presenting because, but I want to make sure that I have the word speak to me first so that I can apply the word of God to my life. And then you can apply the word of God to your life. Brethren, 
God bless you tonight. Thank you for tuning in. God's willing next week, next time, same place. We will be here. We will then enter into the, 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 the dispensation of innocence and we will look at that and we will cover the same points that we covered here in the dispensation of innocence. So God bless you one more time in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we magnify your name. We glorify your name. God, we lift you up and we thank you, God, for you know, that which was presented. We pray, God, that it will reach hearts, reach minds, and, and touch spirits, and it will change lives. We pray that even marriages who are, that are struggling will be better. Individuals who are struggling in their, their Christian living, that you know, they will be better. We pray, God, that you, know, you will touch our minds and touch our conscience, that, that it will be alive. That we will attire ourselves, mighty God, with, with, with holiness as you require. Let your perfect will be done as we dismiss tonight. Dismiss us with your choicest blessing. In Jesus' name. Amen.